Impact of Influence, The Murdoch Family Murders. This is the unfolding story of a powerful South Carolina family, the mysterious deaths they are linked to, and our quest to bring you the truth. Hello, friend. So grateful that you're going to spend some time with us today. Always, always grateful. Matt Harris and Seton Tucker. Matt Harris Podcast at gmail.com. The Murdoch Podcast Facebook page, Murdoch podcast.com i think you're gonna love this episode get a great interview coming up she was just amazing and uh, seton we're not sure what we were gonna have coming into this recording and all of a sudden last night big doings yes there was a big motion filed by the defense team yesterday where they're asking the court to prohibit any testimony from an expert, Tom Bevel. And they're actually requesting court costs and attorney's fees incurred in defending this motion. As a refresher, Tom Bevel was the expert hired by SLED to examine the shirt worn by Alec Murdoch the night of the murders of Maggie and Paul. Bevel's initial report determined that there was not high-velocity blood spatter on the shirt, but this was changed when he had his final report and I guess sled had gone up there and there's a lot of controversy. The shirt was apparently destroyed during the testing process and is not available to be tested by the defense. And the defense claims that Bevel was not given all of the information by sled about their previous testing, uh, which they say said the shirt tested negative for human blood. And if you want to go back to episode 86, titled A Forensic Expert Weighs In on Alec's Defense Motion, we talked with Joseph Scott Morgan, a forensic expert and host of the podcast uh, Body Bags. And he had a, a big breakdown into how those kind of tests work and which are real indicative of human blood versus animal blood, etc. So again, that is uh, episode 86, if you want to check it out. Well, it was kind of crazy, according to this motion, I guess there was still testing happening in December related to this shirt. And I, I thought that that testing would have been completed by that time. Maybe it's not unusual to still be testing, but I, I found that interesting. Considering that he's already been charged, is what you're saying, that they're still testing, even though they have uh, charged him with the, the double murders. Right. And of course, it seems very... With Harpootly and Flair, he says that Mr. Bevel obtained an LVC kit for his upcoming science fair experiment <laughs> in which he will conduct a weekend experiment in his garage or other room in his house to prove Hemitrace always returns false negative when used on substances previously treated with LVC. Um, and he says this is despite multiple peer-reviewed articles. Now, he also included pictures of Bevel's home. And I think what Harpoolie was just saying, look, it's a, it's a house, it's not a laboratory. You can have a, a safe space to test things in a house just because it doesn't look like uh, a big lab with a bunch of people with white coats walking around. Uh, it is like, I agree with you, it's, it's flair. Right. It, it does not <laughs> indicate to me anything about Tom Bevel, that he lives in a house like that. <laughs> well, and they also cite this article for, back from April of 2022 that was published in Fitz News that says, high-velocity impact spatter directly ties Alec Murdoch to the double homicide, sources say. Uh, the defense says that the only possible motive for this leak was to convince the public that Mr. Murdoch was guilty of the murders before the trial, even before he was formally charged. This leak was an extrajudicial statement made on behalf of the state with a deliberate intention to prejudice the preset judicial proceedings. And he also says this was a lie. I don't think that it is unusual from some of the podcasts uh, that I listen to from uh, defense attorneys that sometimes law enforcement does leak some things to get the public in their favor. I don't, I'm not saying that happened in this case. I'm just saying that it has happened in cases. Right. And they're saying that, that this isn't this information is not true, but may prejudice the jury, jury pool. Yeah. yeah we, uh, we, we'll see how yes. that plays out and how Judge Newman will rule on this. 
Brings us to our guest, former law enforcement officer, retired physician, forensic pathologist, medical examiner, author, artist, chef. She is Dr. Michelle Dupree, and she's very familiar with South Carolina. That's where she has worked for many years before she retired. First of all, thanks for uh, joining us. I know we gave you all the uh, documents at the last minute here, but you're ready to roll, and we really appreciate it, Dr. Yeah, my Craig. pleasure. My pleasure. Seen, do you have a spot that you want to start with the, because there's so many things that are in this latest motion. It, there are. And I have been up since the crack of dawn. I'm actually still in my pajamas at the current she time is, because I've been reading, is. I've been reading all of these uh, exhibits that were attached to a motion filed by the defense. And what we learned is based on Dr. Kenneth Kinsey, who is the chief deputy of the Orangeburg County Sheriff's Office and also uh, an expert witness in crime scene investigation and reconstruction. We learn a lot from his report. It gave us so much information and brought up more questions for me. So let's start off with what jumped out to you. Well, really, there's so many things. Um, one, there's two different types of bullets in the shotgun that Paul was shot with. The other thing is the trajectories of the, the sh- the gunshots wounds um, to both Paul and to Maggie. And the number of times that Maggie was shot, she was shot approximately five times. That's a lot. If there was some sort of hired hit, that seemed like maybe they weren't the best shot. Exactly. And also, the um, again, those trajectories, most of them were forward or front to back, which means that, you know, they were facing the, the victims. Uh, let's go back to the two kinds of bullets in the shotgun. The two kinds were the buckshot. What was the other kind? Birdshot. So what, what, does that say anything to you? Uh, or is that a common way to, to load guns mm-hmm. with both? No, it, it is not common at all. In fact, it's really um, suggested that you don't mix them. You know, typically birdshot is used for hunting, for birds, obviously. Buckshot is used much more commonly for self-defense and for larger um, animals. But it's really recommended that you don't mix the two in the same gun. One of the things you mentioned, too, is the angles. And looking at the the, the shooting, the murder of Paul, I'm, I'm trying to put together in my head. Now, Paul's only, I think he's 5'8", right, Seton? 5'8". The one shot appears to come from lower than him. So, I mean, is it someone... Crouching? Does that mean it's someone perhaps in wait? What, what what did you take away from that angle of that shot? Well, it could be a couple of things. One, because it is a shotgun, you can shoot from the hip, which is actually easier than shooting from the shoulder with a shotgun. Um, so that would cause a lower angle. Secondly, depending on you know which shot you think was first, Paul could be falling or could be leaning, could be going down when he was shot, and then that would also account for that. So even a, a, a tall six foot something guy, if he's shooting from the hip, it's going to be below five eight. Is what you're saying? So or he could be falling. Absolutely. And it's not clear in that report which shot was first, is it? No, it really isn't. And again, an, another interesting thing is that, um, and I'll just call it shot number one. Doesn't mean it was the first shot. But the shot to the head and shoulders, there is no stippling. And stippling is something that we see when the the muzzle of the gun is closer to the victim. Shot number two to the chest is the one that had stippling on it. Explain what that is. So stippling is actually, um, many things come out of the end of a barrel of a gun when it's fired. Part of it's unburned metal, you know, smoke, soot fire, all that kind of thing. And the stippling is actually little pieces of metal that will abrade the skin or scratch the skin. And we can, de- we can determine oftentimes the approximate distance the gun is from the target or from the victim according to the diameter of that stippling. So I would assume that the diameter, the closer, the smaller diameter, the further it begins to spread. Correct. Okay. The expert here kind of rendered an opinion on whether you would receive some sort of blood or impact spatter based on the proximity or the closeness of the shooting. What were your thoughts on that? Well, again, it it's a little bit hard to determine. It's going to depend on the, the length of the gun, for one thing, and the length of the distance between the muzzle end of the gun to the target. Typically, we do see some back spatter um, mostly from handguns, um, but you can certainly get it from long guns as well, just depending on those factors. 
Now, the long guns, I guess the issue would be because you're automatically X number of feet away. And I guess the standard rule is something like three feet. So a long gun is putting you already a couple of feet away, correct? So you're, the odds of uh, the spatter changes as a handgun. You're right up on them. Exactly. And again, you would expect a lot less of the um, spatter from a long gun because of those very things you just said. Now, if there's a lot of, in this case, you're looking at the, the, the pictures, it appears the, the room is covered in blood, or at least a lot of blood. Yeah, from the pictures, it did look like there was a lot of blood in the feed room where Paul was killed. Yeah. Does that have anything to do with how much blood would be on the shooter? No, not really. Not not in my opinion. Um, that is going to be because of the severity of the wound to Paul. Okay. And this is how the report reads. It said that, I don't know if it was the first or the second shot, that Paul's brain was completely detached from his head and that this was terminal and immediate. Um, pretty horrific. And now we're just speculating. But so if the first shot is the one that kills him, he would fall relatively quickly, I guess. And so a second shot would be made while he was falling. Yes. So it would make sense that that low shot could have been a, a shot while he was falling. Yes. I always thought the first shot, though, was the shot with the buckshot that went into his chest. I don't know why I always had that in my mind, but maybe that's not the case. Well, the, the buckshot was also the one that had the stippling, which means that they were closer. So uh, you might would think that the other shot, the one to the head and shoulder, was actually the first shot, and then the perpetrator uh, moved up closer as he was falling and made the second shot, causing the stippling. Wow. He'd have to move pretty quickly, right? Because the body's falling fast. Exactly. And you would have to be shooting, like, you know, um, consecutively. Bam, bam. Exactly. Now, Maggie's murder is horrific as well. There are five shots. Do you see a sequence that those shots would have been fired in? Let me tell you how the shots are numbered in the report, and they're not numbered in the order that the expert believes they were fired in, just numbered. So one is a gunshot to the anatomical left side of the torso of Maggie. There is a number two, that's a gunshot to the left wrist. Number three, gunshot to left thigh. Number four, gunshot to the back of the scalp head, and number five, gunshot to upper abdomen. And that, he says, potentially fatal, but not immediate. Yeah, so you would think that two, three, and five were probably the first shots because they were not, you know, lethal. They were not deadly shots. One and four, um, the person would be, you know, almost immediately incapacitated. And shot number one, not in a good order, just as it's numbered in the exhibit, was uh, to the left side of the torso and then went through much of the body, including uh, parts of the head. This was a terminal immediate death shot and there was no apparent exit located. Why did it not exit her body? Um, well, again, it depends on the type of bullet that okay. it is, if it fragments or not. But th it went through such a large part of the body um, that it just did not exit. Okay. Now, the original report, the rumors, whatnot, were that she was running away, and then someone came closer to her and, and did the, the, the kill shots, if you will. Does this play to that initial report? I... I think that it it could, yes. Um, I don't know that she was running away, but she may have t been turning away. Again, I think that these were fired in rather rapid succession. Yeah, we should we should know that this is these are two separate guns. There was one gun that was used to kill Paul, and then the AR was used to kill Maggie. Right, a rifle. That that's right. And you know, personally, I think that is um, a forensic countermeasure. I assume what you're saying is to throw off the scent that it was one killer. Exactly. Huh. So someone in the know of how murders are prosecuted, et cetera, would go two guns to, to confuse the pathologist, but you can't confuse Dr. Dupree, but um, confuse, <laughs> confuse or at least make speculation from the public and whatnot be a little out there, right? That's interesting. Right. 
Does anything in this give you any indication of who was killed first, Maggie or Paul? I don't think it really does. Um, I My theory is that Maggie probably was because um, Alex had apparently you know, called her to meet him there. And whoever killed her at this point um, probably killed her first. Paul probably heard that and was coming out of the kennels and was next. But it's hard to say. A couple things about Paul. I always had in my mind that maybe there was some sort of struggle. But according to the opinion of this expert, he says that there was no indication of a struggle between Paul and his shooter. I agree. I don't think there was a struggle at all. And I would point out to people, of course, if they're unfamiliar, that this is a hunting area. Uh, and also, even in that area, it is not unusual to have, by the dog kennels, a shotgun sitting there or, or in, in, in some sort of vehicle or in the area because they have animals that will come up upon the property. Wait, I've spoken to a lot of people who live in rural areas like this, and they say, you know, if they go outside for some reason at night, they will carry a gun with them. Sure. I also had some questions about Paul's cell phone. This report says that Paul's phone was removed from his pocket. Right. And that's because blood was found on the inside of that back pocket. And the only way that it could really get there, of course, is if um, he was shot and either he or someone else, and not likely him because of the severity of the wounds, someone took the gun out or tried to take it out and put it back. And that's interesting because... We were led to believe at some point during this that it was under Paul's body and that Alec got it and tried to roll the body over but couldn't. And now the report is saying that they took the phone from his back pocket. That's a that's kind of a game changer in the sense that if Alec did say that, it could be seen as or proven as a lie. And second of all, why would a murderer want to take a phone out of somebody's pocket if it is for any other reason? other than to see what's on the phone, right? That's true, but we should also consider that maybe someone else removed the phone from Paul's pocket and then Alec retrieved it and placed it on Paul. But also, ju- just placing it on top of his, his buttocks would not cause blood to be on the inside of the pocket. Oh, good point. Was there anything interesting about the shell casings that were found that you saw that jumped out at you? Not particularly. And, okay. you know, one thing about shell casings is... You know, we try to read a lot into that, but, you know, they bounce. They can get kicked around by, you know, various and sundry people. Um, So, no, not really. The one thing that, you know, would be interesting, of course, is to try and get fingerprints off of those. It's hard to do in some cases, but there is a new technique where you can do uh, like electromagnetic testing on those. Because even just touching a shell casing for loading the gun, that is going to leave an imprint. The fingerprints will be gone because of the heat. But um, there, there is that possibility. And Dr. Dupree, I know you told me you had a question about the time of death. I really want to know how the coroner determined the time of death. You know, I want, I want some description of the blood pool. Was it completely dried? Was it congealed? Was it, did it have a light film over it? Tell me how you came up with that time of death. Because I think that also would play a big part sure. in establishing, you know, the time frame. Who decides on time of death? Well, in this state, um, it's the coroner. Um, the coroner is the one who um, signs a death certificate and establishes that time of death. So when the prosecution had to come up with a time frame, maybe this, they made this really wide time frame of something like 8.30 to 9.30 or something. Yeah. Are they allowed to not use the coroner's uh, time of death or is the coroner an approximation? How does that work? Well, time of death is always an approximation. I mean, it is an estimate. It's not like on TV, you know, where it's like <laughs> 936, you know. Unless you have some sort of a clock sitting An there. eyewitness who actually sees the time when yeah. the person was exactly. murdered. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, you know, a, a narrow range of an hour or so is, I mean, that that's really pretty good. But we, again, I want to know, you know, specifically how was that determined, you know, um, I mean, was the body still warm to touch? All kinds of things like that help us make a real um, educated guess on time of death. So that could come out at trial, and we just don't know it yet, but that could be, the coroner could be called. Yeah, it could be, yes. All right, you also have some questions about the shirt with possible spatter on it. I, w- I was interested to know in the um, 
let's say pattern analysis, how was the shirt actually tested for gunshot residue? Because if it was SEM, a scanning electron microscope, that is definitive. That is definitely gunshot residue. And even though uh, only three particles were found, that's still definitive. Um, and I read where they believe that that is from Alex handling the gun, not necessarily firing it. And that's fine. But then, you know, when did he handle a gun other than that night? And if he handled a gun that night, where is it? Because to my knowledge, we don't have the guns yet. And when we're talking about the shirt, the person that SLED used was a guy named Tom Bevel. And the defense is trying to discredit Tom. But you've worked with Tom, right? Yes. I actually, well, you know, I taught at the Criminal Justice Academy here in South Carolina, and I taught crime scene. And in that, I taught blood spatter analysis. When I was in the Caribbean, I actually worked with Tom. We conducted a seminar for the um, Caribbean uh, police forces on crime scene investigation, and I brought Tom down to do blood spatter analysis and crime scene reconstruction. So I have worked with him. So you, you obviously, since you brought him down, you have confidence in his ability as a scientist. I do. Tom has been doing this for a very long time. And I know that one thing in the, um, in the court document stated that he didn't have any certifications or something in blood stain pattern analysis. But you have to realize that originally, blood stain pattern analysis was not a separate credential or discipline. It was all wrapped up in crime scene analysis. It wasn't until, I'd say, I don't know the exact year, but relatively recently, 10, 12 years ago, where they took blood stain pattern analysis out of crime scene investigation and made it its own you know, certification discipline. Well, and Joseph Scott Morgan, who is the host of Body Bags, also spoke very highly of him as well. So this, you think this idea of discrediting him as an expert is, is nonsense? I do. Um, I mean, they raised some good questions. And I'm sure that when, um, if and when Tom has an opportunity to um, rebut those, that there will be, you know, good explanations for some of those. And again, you know, looking at the shirt, for example, it does look like it to me that it is um, high velocity. But, you know, microscopic examination, not just photographic examination, um, really is the key. And so with further information or more information, things can change. Without the defense being able to actually get the physical shirt, is that going to be problematic with keeping the shirt as evidence? I would think so, because, you know, in... In um, forensics, any time we have a sample and testing that sample uses it up entirely or destroys it, it's always a problem for the defense because the defense, of course, has the right to have their own expert examine that very same evidence. And in this case, that's not possible because part of that was destroyed. Sheesh, you nailed it. This is such a great interview. Yeah, oh. Really? So I've learned so much. I mean, I should have maybe changed and not wore my pajamas so I could just listen to her and she could explain it all to me. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it very much. I'd love to have you on again. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, you guys. Take care. Well, let's uh, talk about some correspondence you had. Yes, I reached out to Mark Tinsley, who is the attorney representing Mallory Beach's family, as well as some of the other boaters who were involved in the accident where Mallory was killed. And we talked about in our last episode this settlement negotiation that he had with Maggie's estate and Buster. And now there have been several objections that have been filed by Johnny Parker, who was one of Ellick's former law partners, and also Palmetto State Bank. Um, they both filed objections. And I reached out to Mark Tinsley for a comment. And Matt, why don't you read that? He said in the email, in a case fraught with moments that leave you speechless, this is a shocking turn of events. Mr. Parker has taken a meritless position in his objection to a settlement that merely attempts to salvage what is left of Maggie's estate and give some closure to those who so desperately need it. Clearly, he doesn't have standing to make this objection. If his position as a lien holder of a secret backroom confessed judgment were so important to him, I think he would have done something to perfect a claim against Maggie's estate. But he did not, and it's now too late for him to try and jump to the front of the line he was never in. Well, it is sad that, it, you know, there's not that much left to be had of the pot, and these claims may reduce that even further. And along those lines, uh, Mark emailed, Love your podcast, been following it for more or less a year. 
I was listening to it just now. I was driving. I heard Seton say that Connor Cook is Mallory Beach's boyfriend. That's not exactly correct. Anthony Cook is Mallory Beach's boyfriend. I know Seton just misspoke. Yes, I did mess that up, and I was listening to it, and I immediately caught it and had one of those, Ugh, I can't yeah. believe I messed that up. And thank you, Mark, for the email to keep it straight, and also the way you just said, hey, I like the show. She mis- mis- just misspoke. It's supposed to, she doesn't know what she's talking about. No, I was <laughs> planning to fix that this episode, so we, we, we got- always like for people to help us clarify any mistakes that we make. Because we do make some on occasion. I know it's hard to believe we're not perfect. I uh, also want to discuss the fact that you or us, we are not getting a permanent media seat in the courtroom. Yeah, they released a list of who would reserve seat, and it was only one person per organization, and we were not on that list, and it was kind of disappointing. However, when you look back about how we started this, and forgive forgive us if you've heard the story before, but most haven't, because it was one of the very first episodes, we're in episode 90-something, you had been following this case starting with uh, the Mallory Beach death. Yeah, I just started following it as an average citizen, just really interested in that case. It struck a, a nerve with you, so you, you dug deep into it, you got into the Stephen Smith thing and reached out to Sandy Smith long before we were doing the podcast, and then the murders of Maggie and Paul happen, and it's just a few nights after that, maybe even the next night, I'm not exact, I think it might even be the next night, you're out with my wife, because you're both friends, and you start telling her this story. I, I, I'd said I really had been wanting to do a podcast about it forever, but I was concerned about legality and just didn't want to do it, or wanted to do it, but just didn't do it because of concerns about being sued. And, all and how to do it. Really? And how to do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had no experience with this and it was kind of daunting. And you brought it up to my wife and she's like, well, Matt, you know, he does a radio job and he's got a podcast, which is about just goofy stuff. Uh, and he's always wanted to do true crime, which I did. I never knew that you were such a true crime person until this all started. Yes. And so uh, the very next day, you and I got together and started talking about this. And it was blowing my mind, all the things you were telling me. And so I decided, let's just do it. Because before I've just been analyzing, you know, you pick a case and then you start analyzing, like, I don't know, it's good enough, da, 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 And then we went to one studio and we couldn't figure out how to do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> and we had to bring the big dog, we had to bring Dwayne in. <laughs> yes. And so I'm thinking of like, okay, who can I have do this? And Dwayne has a tiny house outside his studio. And I, my wife and the kids, whatever, had stayed here for a few days uh, a few summers ago and I remembered that he had a studio and so I texted him I'm like he usually does music like Dwayne how about uh, doing a podcast he's like heck yeah come on in so we pop in here and bing bang boom we were off and running and we go back and listen to those first few episodes don't (laughs) we did have a review on one of those recently it just basically said I don't know what this podcast is about I guess maybe they might have just listened to the first few and yeah we get it I wish sometimes you could respond to those, but oh well. Right. When they're on Apple, you can't respond. No. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So we have, we just, we were just in there and started yapping and uh, we have hopefully gotten better and we do appreciate it because we do have uh, some really cool listeners that send us information and we have great contacts with experts now that we've gotten through the last few years. And so it's always appreciated. Speaking of appreciated, you got a shout out. And I do want to give a shout out from one of our listeners, Gareth, who lives in the Raleigh-Durham area. He is also Australian, and he listens to our podcast. So I wanted to give a shout out. She says that because we've had a couple of Australians email us and comment. The, the last one was about how he could just listen to you talk for hours, and your husband's a lucky bloke. I know. I loved that. You got the Australian market cornered. Very good. Uh, always grateful to hear from you. and. Keep it coming. Uh, I should say this one's from uh, Monica. Matt just said, wackadoodle. (laughs) That cracked me up. Love the inclusion of experts and lack of drama. So thank you, Monica. Matt Harris, podcast at gmail.com. We've got the trial starting up uh, just a few days from now. They're going to start picking out jurors. I got to thank Vinnie Politan and the 
folks over at Court TV have continued to have me on. So if you turn on Court TV, there's been a good chance you've seen me over the last few days. And he even wants to have me meet him down at the trial to chat. Yes, Matt has been doing a great job, you know, representing the podcast on lots of different yes, live a things. Yes, different uh, TV things going on. You can go to Murdoch Podcast on Facebook or MurdochPodcast.com. Always grateful, and we will talk soon, friend.